Members, I'm the author of the bill uh, we're about to hear, and so I'm going to hand over the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Howard for the presentation of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 3244, uh, as introduced, be laid over. And would you like me to proceed with it? Y yes, Madam Chair, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, uh, today's bill is a part of the Homes for All Coalition agenda. Um, and I am um, delighted to um, present that. We have the, the co-chairs, uh, Annie Shapiro, I know is here. Uh, she won't be testifying, but she is available for questions should you have any uh, of her. Um, this is uh, the first part of this is 400 million in uh, appropriation bonds, um, housing infrastructure bonds. Um, you uh, recall my talking about this as a new tool in 2014. Um, GEO bonds could only be used for public infrastructure. And so um, this tool uh, enables us to partner with nonprofits. So we leverage um, a good bit of uh, private money at, as well. I think $3 for every $1 of state money, something like that. Um, so uh, housing infrastructure bonds fund the development of affordable rental and home ownership opportunities. Uh, it includes supportive housing, senior housing, manufactured home acquisition, uh, and infrastructure improvement, um, as well as affordable home ownership opportunities. Uh, you've heard Minnesota Housing say that um, they say no to three of every four um, requests that they get for this funding. And so uh, we're making a more aggressive ask this year. Um, more funding is needed to make an impact on our housing uh, shortage. Um, there's also a deeper affordability as a new eligible usage. Uh, our greatest need in our state is for deeply affordable housing, and this eligible use will target the deepest affordability. And um, we've always said uh, uh, permanent supportive housing is a good is our best model, but not all housing requires those supportive services, and and that is made clear here. Um, uh, this um, the tool will help serve people up to 50% AMI, but with a specific focus on people at or below 30%. Um, 100 million in geo bonds for public housing. 95% of the public housing is over 35 years old. Um, housing authorities often don't have the resources to invest in critical repairs like roof repair, upgrading heating, investing in security. The need um, is, is more like uh, 180 million. Uh, but 100 million will, will go a long way. So this will help ensure people living in public housing live in safe, healthy, and stable housing. And Mr. Chair, we have some testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll move to our first testifier who is, hold on a second, lost my agenda here for the moment. Uh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Uh we have um, uh, Wendy Underwood from Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis up first. Ms. Great. Underwood. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair. Uh, it is a real privilege to be with you today. Uh, for the record, my name is Wendy Underwood. I'm Vice President of Social Justice Advocacy and Engagement at Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis. I am really pleased to be here today to speak in favor of House File 3244 on behalf of Homes for All and for the hundreds of residents at Catholic Charities housing sites who have a permanent home because of housing infrastructure bonds, and especially on a day like today, as I look out my window. Uh, I am also uh, pleased to see in the bill a preference to those projects at or below 30% AMI. As uh, Chair Houseman said, um, uh, the opportunity here for truly deeply affordable housing is, is very real and, and we are excited to see that. Catholic Charities is known in the region for providing emergency shelter services, but we are also a, one of the largest providers of permanent supportive housing with 950 current apartments rented to Minnesotans who have experienced long-term homelessness or have other health and physical challenges. Many are veterans. We are excited to share that thanks to this committee's commitment to HIVs and the hard work of local partners, we will be opening a new location this spring. 
With the support of HIVs, we were able to purchase a former nursing home facility just outside of downtown Minneapolis in the beautiful Elliott Park neighborhood. Endeavors residents will replace our longstanding site in downtown Minneapolis, known as Exodus, and will add an additional nearly 100 deeply affordable apartments to our total uh, number of apartments available. Endeavors Residence also provides supportive services to help a person's ability to be and stay independent. This includes case management services and other assistance. This neighborhood is very close to amenities like transportation, social services, jobs, and healthcare, the things that our residents, just like you and me, need and value every day. Our residents are full-time renters, they sign leases with the rights and expectations of a typical market rate apartment. I want to note that it was our residents, our current residents at Exodus and our staff who collaborated to choose the new name Endeavors that is inclusive and welcoming to all individuals of all backgrounds. A life isn't always linear and Endeavors honors each resident's journey. We're, we're, really, um, we're really proud of that. Uh, we were able to use HIVs to rehab this existing older building. No deconstruction was needed or no um, major physical additions were added. Uh, we converted nursing home rooms into efficiency and single room occupancy apartments. We converted nursing stations into community rooms and shared kitchen spaces. And uh, we only had to update uh, the large uh, commercial kitchen. We did not have to build anything new. Uh, we made improvements to HVAC, the roof, et cetera, the things that are often necessary in a rehab with an older building. Uh, but we are very excited that this was a clear, um, a successful reuse of an existing site. The site is large and uh, presented a number of opportunities for us. Uh, and while HIVs can only be used for the purchase and rehab for the housing units, um, the commitment from this committee in the state of Minnesota um, helped us to secure additional funds from Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. as well as our many generous donors, so that we could purchase the entire site and convert some of it into three very important projects in addition to our nearly 200 apartments. Um, those three things um, located at our site is a 30 room recuperative care center for people experiencing homelessness who no longer need emergency room care. This relieves pressure and costs on our ERs while providing people with a safe and dignified place to recuperate. It's a very successful program that we run in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Really excited for this. We will also be the site for a permanent community clinic providing healthcare, psychiatric, psychiatric services, and more uh, to people who meet a certain income limit. This will be a new asset in the neighborhood. And finally, we will be bringing home all of our administrative services and our aging and disability services team. Um, all of these entities have been scattered around our sites for years, and we are all coming to Elliott Park, which equates to over 200 full-time jobs we are bringing to the neighborhood. Uh, we could not have purchased the building and added these valuable services without housing infrastructure bonds. It's worth noting, I think this is really important, this body approved an investment in HIVs at the end of your 2019 legislative session. We were awarded HIVs that November, completed the funding with Hennepin County and Minneapolis in December, and began renovations in the fall of 2020 uh, so that we can start moving in uh, this spring. Uh, and while this chain of events took a lot of work and just enough luck, it was possible because of the public-private partnership that started with this body and that HIV award. We reused an existing building. We are bringing 200 jobs to a new neighborhood. We are hosting innovative healthcare opportunities. And most importantly, we are providing nearly 175 truly deeply affordable apartments to Minnesotans. At Catholic Charities, we talk a lot about the power of home and how home is more than four walls and a roof, uh, but it is safety and dignity. It is a sense of peace and opportunity. It is stability. 
Our new Endeavors residents for Minnesotans who have experienced homelessness, many of them veterans and with physical disabilities, through housing infrastructure bonds and the commitment of this committee in the state of Minnesota, they, they too will get to have that power of home in just a few short months, uh, just a few months. Um, while we are adding a net 100 deeply affordable apartments to the region this spring, it is clear from the demands of our emergency shelters that the significant need for deeply affordable housing is only growing. The investment proposed here today would make a very real difference. I encourage you to support House File 3244. Thank you so much for your leadership and for this opportunity. Thank you. Next up, we have Sarah Harris from Aon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members. Um, also, thank you, Ms. Underwood, for your testimony. I echo it completely. Um, I am Sarah Harris. I'm the Executive Vice President of Strategy Partnerships and Production at Aon. And by way of background, Aon was founded in 1985. We are a not-for-profit developer and owner and manager of nearly 6,000 affordable units, largely in the greater Twin City area. It's important to note that more than one quarter of our homes are affordable at or below the 30% AMI, and we are one of the largest providers of housing for high priority homeless. Interestingly, Aon was founded because the Minneapolis Convention Center construction demolished a considerable, in the hundreds, uh, a considerable amount of affordable housing in downtown Minneapolis, and that was on the heels of a significant loss of thousands of units throughout the community in that decade. So here we are some 30 years later, and we are still facing a housing crisis in our community. Um, we currently provide over 6,000 units, as I mentioned. We serve approximately 16,000 people in our community. And each year, uh, Minnesota is continuing to lose significantly more affordable housing to market investors than we are able to build based on the constrained funding that is available for new development of affordable housing. And that's important to note because housing improvement bonds are an important part of the affordable housing resource toolkit by themselves. And they also have a multiplier effect since they pair with the 4% tax credits and allow more of those tax credits to come into our state, which leverages even more affordable housing to happen than just the housing improvement bonds, the housing infrastructure bonds themselves. As Ms. Underwood noted, um, she was talking about uh, the projects that have come to light because of housing infrastructure bonds. I'd like to spend a little time talking about the future of how more resource for HIBs could be helpful in bringing more people into homes in our community. This year, we were successful in competing for housing infrastructure bonds for 162 households in two buildings. One will be in downtown St. Paul and will be a fully supportive building with 88 units serving those most deeply in need of housing. The other building is focused on senior residents, people 55 and older, who are living in the Big Lake area. What these buildings have in common is that they are providing homes for people that need them. They are located in the state of Minnesota. It doesn't matter if you're in the core of downtown or if you're in the suburbs, exurbs, or greater Minnesota. Everybody needs a stable home and place to live. Like Ms. Underwood noted, our new buildings will be built adjacent to transportation and many of the other in investments that have been made to keep people uh, connected into their community in an affordable uh, location. In addition to these two buildings, we have in the near term over 1500 units of housing in our portfolio that needs to be updated, needs to, can uh, have additions uh, added to the properties and can deliver housing for more than 3000 more people. Included in that portfolio is the second largest um, housing complex in the state of Minnesota, Huntington Place. And our goal is having acquired the property, we are now looking to renovate and uh, help the property to live for another 30 years in our community. 
The funding through HIBs allows us to develop and preserve affordable rental housing, and it helps us to provide safer and more stable housing to people who are at risk of experiencing homelessness, seniors, and the like. HF 3244 includes critical investments in housing infrastructure bonds, which can support more projects like ours, like those described by Catholic Charities, and help us to address our housing shortage and crisis. I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have uh, Ms. Missy Becker-Cook from West Central Minnesota Communities Action. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 3244. Um, my coworker, Joe Niehaus, is also um, on and will help me with the presentation. Um, we are presenting to you a, a program that we are offering through West Central Minnesota Community Action, and it's a community land trust. And um, so just a little history, West Central Community Action is a nonprofit um, community action agency, one of 24 in the state of Minnesota. And our mission um, is to provide um, home ownership and affordable housing options in rural Minnesota. Our agency serves five core counties of Douglas, Hope, Stevens, Traverse, and Grant. And so our community land trust um, homes, uh, right now we are focusing on Douglas and Polk counties, and that's Alexandria and Glenwood area. Um, you know, as, as around the state um, has happened, the same has happened in rural Minnesota and that homes under $200,000 when they come up for sale are snatched up quickly by investors and um, rents have, increased dramat dramatically in rural Minnesota. And so um, West Central Community Action has a unique partnership with the Department of Corrections in which they supply a housing uh, builder. And we, we have a contract with them and we do inmate labor. And so we have built um, around 150 houses to date um, with the Department of um, Corrections labor, uh, inmate labor program. It's called the ICWC crew, Interwork Correctional Work Crew, I believe is the, the title. Mm -hmm. So um, we are fortunate to be able to bring down the cost of housing with that, with that um, cooperation and partnership with Department of Corrections. So the Community Land Trust, I'm going to um, have Joe talk a little bit about um, the uniqueness of this in rural Minnesota. Yes, thank you. Um, community land trusts are, are proven ways to provide affordable home ownership opportunities to low and middle income buyers, um, making the price of the home 20 to 30% below the market rate. We, we have a ground lease that they signed, which preserves the land for long-term community benefit and affordability. The home buyer owns the home and leases the land from the trust allowing them to build equity in the house while also keeping the home part of the land trust and keeping it affordable for future buyers. Um, all buyers and subsequent buyers um, are, need to be income eligible and homeowner occupied. Um, we launched the land trust. We offer buyer consulting, financial education, um, and also some down payment assistance of $8,500 for eligible buyers. In January of 2022, we received funding from Minnesota Housing, including housing infrastructure bonds to build six additional affordable workforce houses in Douglas Pope and Otter Tail counties. Um, these houses will be built in partnership with Habitat for Humanity in Douglas County and the Department of Corrections. Um, the funding that we received from Minnesota Housing will help us expand access to affordable home, home ownership in West Central Minnesota especially for our community members who face the greatest barriers to home ownership. HF 3244 includes critical investments in housing and infrastructure bonds, which can support more community land trusts and affordable home ownerships across the state. Thank you. And we have one more testifier, 
Melissa Taphorn from Washington County Community Development Agency. Ms. Taphorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Houseman and committee members. I am here today. My name is Melissa Taphorn. I'm the Executive Director of the Washington County CDA Community Development Agency. And I also serve as the Legislative Chair of Minnesota NARA, which stands for the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. And uh, we have 140 housing authority or housing agency members in Minnesota NARA. And um, we are supportive of this full bill, but I wanted to speak specifically to the part of the bill about general obligation bonds for the re uh, rehabilitation of public housing. And I do have a presentation that um, going to share here. All right, our members own and operate over 20,000 units of publicly owned housing and illustrated on this map is where that housing is located across the state. And housing, uh, public housing is a critical piece of the housing continuum. It provides safe and affordable homes to extremely low income people who would otherwise lack of adequate housing. And in those 20,000 units, there are over 36,500 Minnesotans who are living in and paying rent on a public housing unit. The majority of our residents survive on $288 per week. The vast majority of households are headed by seniors or persons with disabilities. However, a third of our residents are minor children. Minnesota NARO strongly supports the provision of general obligation bonds to support publicly owned housing program. POP, as we refer to it, 95%, um, as Representative Houseman mentioned earlier, 95% of our units are over 35 years old. And due to repeated shortfalls in federal appropriations, there's a backlog of capital improvements at our properties. And as you can imagine, postponing capital investments for properties negatively affects their financial viability and affects resident well-being. Minnesota NARO sincerely appreciates the past bipartisan support um, that this program has seen over the past 10 years. Uh, the GO bond proceeds have been used for health, safety, and energy efficiency improvements at our properties. And as you can see by this slide, there's been um, over the past 10 years, $61.5 million um, invested in our public housing. I'd like to share just a brief view of six of those 113 POP projects. And these uh, particular six examples are typical of the variety of projects that have been funded by the POP program. First here is at Itasca County HRA, um, which stands for Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Their building faced poor air quality, um, and no way to adequately circulate and exchange air in the building. In the winter, large amounts of condensation appeared on windows and sills. The water heater was original to the building and not energy efficient, and it required repair. Residents could be without, it, if it required repair, so if it broke down, uh, residents would be without water, hot water until parts could be obtained. And in 2017, a POP project allowed the HRA to install an air handling system to circulate fresh air into the building, correcting the moisture and condensation issues. And during the air handling project, they disconnected, or there were disconnected vents, and those were corrected in the attic spaces and insulation was added. In addition, two new energy efficient water heaters were installed so that one, when, if one went down, the other um, would be operating and residents would continue to have hot water while they repaired the others. And then especially important um, are the improvements that tenants cannot see, which keeps them safe and secure, which is what you see here in the first set of pictures on the left side. In the Wil this Wilmer HRA apartment, several unrated plumbing chases were discovered, which means the enclosures for the plumbing piping had to meet current fire code and also had to be properly separated at each floor to meet that code. The second set of photos portray the before and after of install updated shower stalls. Um, which were not accessible for many people. Um, and so many, of the, so many of our residents who live in public housing are elderly and or have a disability. So these improvements are very much needed and appreciated by those residents. And the Wilmar HR, or, sorry, Virginia HRA used their POP dollars for fire safety and security upgrades. They have two buildings consisting of 147 units 
that are the two buildings are connected. However, the buildings had separate antiquated building fire alarm systems with no connection of the systems between the two buildings. The fire safety upgrades in included installation of a new connected fire alarm system and the replacement of the fire doors and common area door hardware to meet American Disabilities Act. And um, common area bathrooms were also renovated to meet ADA requirements and security cameras were installed for resident safety and security. The Red Wing HRA um, received two pop loans. Um, the first one was to replace windows and these were windows that needed to meet ADA requirements. Again, considering our population, um, the windows require require less than five pounds of operating force to open and close. So that was very important to their residents. And then their second pop loan um, was used to replace two boilers and air handling units in another public housing apartment. These systems were original to the building when it was built in 1974. And um, my last example here is from the St. Paul PHA Public Housing Agency, where they made significant public or capital improvements to one of their 88 unit public housing townhome neighborhoods. And these uh, buildings were originally built in 1965. POP funds were used to improve safety and security by replacing sidewalks and adding exterior lights to improve the energy efficiency and sustainability by replacing the siding, changing the roof pitch and adding new windows and to improve accessibility by renovating and modernizing kitchens and bathrooms. Overall, this project supported almost 135 jobs and um, the general contractors subcontracted to a combined 13% of the work to minority and women owned businesses. Many thanks to the contractors who provided building trades pre-apprenticeship opportunities for PHA residents. And although this investment has been made a tremendous impact, it only represents about a third of the public housing units across the state, and they challenge us to do more. In 2019, Minnesota NARO commissioned a report to quantify the unmet critical needs in public housing stock across the state. The immediate need is nearly three, $355 million. Um, not reflected in those numbers are the cost to upgrade and retrofit sprinkler systems, Although we have done a lot to preserve this critical asset and are making wise investments by the, with those dollars, there's more work to be done. Steady and consistent attention is a solid, fiscally responsible way to preserve our publicly owned assets. And in closing, I would leave you with these takeaways. We know that the unmet need is over $350 million. Our request is for $100 million, or the request in this bill is. And um, however, when we leverage our general those general obligation bonds or the POP funds with our existing public housing capital fund dollars and stretch our local resources, um, we can bring that $355 million of unmet immediate critical needs really close to zero and set us on a course to be able to plan better and handle our five and 10 year capital improvements better. I can tell you from our agency's perspective that we have invested $2 million in our 140 unit apartment building, public housing building in Forest Lake. And um, we were lucky enough to receive $630,000 of POP funds um, from the state. And we are set to not have to come back to the state for any additional resources, we know as we plan for our five-year and our 10-year capital needs that we'll be able to um, do those projects with solely our public housing capital funds. And thank you again for this opportunity, and I would be willing to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tephorn. That is our last testifier. Members, do, you, uh, do we have any questions for uh, the testifiers or for the bill author? Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to uh, Chair Houseman for bringing this bill forward. I guess I just want to really extend my thanks to NARO for coming and giving us the presentation that we just saw. Um, you know, I guess this this is just, uh, you know, we, the deferred maintenance in public housing is just such a huge health and safety issue. As we saw, um, you know, a, a really tragic fire in public housing in Minneapolis, uh, gosh, I can't remember, it was a few years ago, where there were no 
sprinklers on the upper floors um, of this building that had been built, I think like in the sixties or something. So it was like before there were regulations about sprinklers. Um, and you know, it's, it's, a it was a tower that was full of elders and folks with disabilities and it was, it was impossible for them to get out and, and we lost lives that day. And so this is just such a, it is literally a life and death issue at some point, you know, I, I mean, the, our testifier said that we're not dealing necessarily with sprinkler systems, but these are kind of like life and safety issues, basic life safety issues in infrastructure, housing that is owned by the government. So this is squarely our responsibility. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I guess I'm just really happy to see, you know, I know that this has been um, a priority of Chair Houseman's over many years, and I'm happy to see this proposal for something approaching the actual amount um, of dollars that is needed in this to invest in this really critical piece of infrastructure of public infrastructure. Um, I was surprised. I, I mean, you know, I've only been around here a few years, but like we passed a huge bonding bill, October, 2020. And I mean, I think it had 16 or $20 million for this piece of critical public infrastructure. And in our bonding bills, we all know, you know, there's all these like little like pet projects of this person and that person. And there's like, you know, ice arenas and museums and municipal golf courses. And it's like, this is people's lives. This is people's homes. This is people's literal life. It's literal, literally a life or death situation. And so, you know, I, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a regional issue. This, you know, this housing serves, um, you know, particularly elders and people with disabilities in every corner of our state. And so, you know, I just, I'm really grateful for the chair and we need to come up with a big number, with a big adequate investment in this critical public resource in this time of plenty, in this state of plenty, in this country of plenty. Um, it is, none of us should accept that, that elderly people died because of lack of investment in homes that are owned by the government. It is unacceptable. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Gomez. And I see a hand from Representative Breyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Hausman, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, when I joined this committee, as well as the uh, Capital Investment in Preventing Homelessness, I was um, astounded to see how low our investment is as a state in housing. Uh, three tenths of a percent of the state budget uh, goes directly to housing. And so it's been a priority to me to keep uh, advancing work like that, which Chair Hausman is carrying to, to be a voice to say, we need to be building more homes. We need. Uh, multifamily single housing, we need to be maintaining the housing stock we have. We need to be thinking about what does it take to have a roof over people's heads because with that, then we can address the issues of health care, of education, uh, reduce the stress and the mental health of people and give everyone an opportunity. So I just really wanted to express my gratitude to Chair Hausman for bringing this forward. Thank you. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have more of a procedural question for Chair Hausman. Um, what, what is your uh, preferred or anticipated path forward with this bill? I don't believe there's a, uh, a Senate companion yet. Just wondering if you could help us. As you know, I've been a, a supporter of housing infrastructure bonds in the past. I'm just wondering what the plan is. Uh, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. Um, uh, I'm going to be before the Capital Investment Committee, I think, uh, in, a, in a week or two. Um, uh, the housing infrastructure bonds and the GEO bonds have uh, uh, been in the, uh, the House Capital Investment uh, Bill. Um, the GEO bonding is required to be there because mm -hmm. GEO bonds require a supermajority vote. Appropriation bonds, because it's a different kind of tool, wouldn't have to be, and we have a time or two have had that bill travel separately. But I believe this year the intention is for them to include both the housing infrastructure bonds and the uh, geo bonds for public housing in the um, in the House Capital Investment um, Bill, as as has I think traditionally been done over the last few years. Representative Jurgens. 
Uh, thank you for the clarification, Chair Hausman. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. So today we're we, we're um, laying this bill over. We're not. It's it doesn't have to advance out of our committee. And I don't see any other questions, and so I'll turn it back to Representative Hausman for any final uh, comments on the bill. Well, Mr. Chair, I'll just underscore the point that Representative Gomez was making, um, uh, just to set the historical context. In 2014, we began to turn around that state uh, investment, and that year we did 80 million in housing infrastructure bonds and 20 million uh, for geo bonds for public housing. In the big bill she referenced, October 2020, we went backwards. We did 16 million. And so we really have to redouble our efforts in the area of, of public housing. Um, we had uh, wonderful testimony today about uh, needs all across the state. So um, that, that one, we've got uh, significantly more effort. Um, and as I mentioned to Representative Jurgens, we go on to capital investment, where I know at least Representative Ryer and Representative Bagjay have a voice and can can help us there. I'm trying to remember if we have any others from this committee who are there. Um, but um, we'll look forward to progress on that um, in that regard. Thank you all for your attention. And Representative Hausman, you just want to renew your motion to lay the bill over? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do renew my motion that House File 3244 be laid over. House File 3244 has been laid over.